Welcome to Networking Fundamentals. This online program by Juniper Networks is designed as an introduction to how networks work, how they communicate information between computers, and, in the case of the Internet, how data, such as email messages, traverse the millions of miles of networks worldwide to end up at the correct computer. This program includes numerous interactive exercises to help communicate and reinforce the information. This program is about five hours long. When you think about it, it's amazing. You type a few keystrokes, click a few mouse clicks, and an email is sent nearly instantaneously across the world. Or you launch a web browser and type a URL, and a web page automatically appears. How does that happen? Today, networks impact all of us, from corporate workers collaborating on projects to grandparents exchanging photos with their grandchildren. But how many of us know how that email or photo gets from point A to point B? Or how a simple URL gets to the correct web server? At its core, a network is simply the conduit one computer uses to send information to another computer. Add up all those conduits, though, and soon you begin to wonder how those millions of networks, all interconnected to form the Internet, manage to keep all that data straight. And considering there are billions of computers on the Internet, how is it possible that data manages to end up in the right place at all? In this program, we answer all these questions. We'll start with a generic model of how networks operate, specifically networks like the Internet, then discuss specific networking technologies and protocols. At the end, we combine this information and show you just how data gets from point A to point B. So let's get started. We just mentioned that a network is simply a conduit that connects at least two computers. In fact, the two devices don't need to be computers. A computer sending data to a shared printer is using a network. Of course, most networks are more complicated than that. Every business with more than a handful of employees has at least one network which is what allows you to share a spreadsheet or document with a coworker. Large companies commonly have remote offices connected to corporate headquarters. Many homes are networked too, so your entire family can all share a single printer instead of buying printers for each computer. Finally, more and more people are using mobile devices to access email and the internet. And while the details of each specific type of network are beyond the scope of this course, all networks, however simple or complicated, use the same fundamental concepts and building blocks. There are two basic kinds of networks. Any group of computers on a single geographically limited network is called a local area network or LAN. LANs allow users to exchange documents and share resources such as printers or file servers. A LAN can be either wired or wireless or a combination of both. We discuss the different LAN components and how information is sent from one computer to another later in this course. LANs can be connected to other LANs by way of a wide area network or WAN. A WAN might connect a remote sales office to corporate headquarters across the country or across the world. A WAN might also connect your home network to the Internet. We discuss several different WAN technologies and the network components used to interconnect LANs later in this course. But before we can start discussing the details about the different network components used in LANs or WANs, we need to understand how information created by an application on one computer gets to an application on another computer. We'll start by examining a similar network model in the next section. Think about the last time you mailed a letter. How does the post office actually route the letter to its destination? In many ways, computer networks work on the same principles as the post office. Let's look at this in more detail. Imagine you've written your friend a letter. You put it in an envelope and address the envelope. If you examine the address closely, you'll notice it is written in a hierarchical format, starting with the most specific information, your friend's name, followed by the street address, and ending with the postal code, which is the most general information. The post office needs each different level or layer of information to route the letter to its final destination. Once you address the letter, you drop the envelope in a post office box and the mail carrier picks up the letter and takes it to the nearest post office. All this may seem very obvious, and really, it's analogous to the steps involved in writing and sending an email. Clicking the Send button is the equivalent of dropping it in the mailbox. It's at the post office, though, the entrance to the network in this analogy, where we're going to focus our attention. The post office sorts the envelopes by destination using the postal code. 
the most general information in the address. Your letter is placed into a container and sent to the next post office along the route to its destination, where the letter is put into another container and the process is repeated until it reaches the final post office. Notice that the envelope might be placed into several different containers along the way, but the address on the envelope is never changed. Another key point is that the first post office doesn't usually use the entire postal code, just the first few digits. As the envelope makes its way from post office to post office toward the final destination, the sorting equipment looks at additional digits. Eventually, the entire postal code is used, and all the mail in the container has the same postal code and is destined for the same post office. Once there, it's then sorted again based on more specific information, the street address, for the mail carrier to deliver. Only when the envelope is delivered to the correct house is the recipient's name examined because more than one person might reside at that same address. Computer networks work in much the same way. We'll cover this topic in more detail later. But in short, like handing off letters and packages from post office to post office, networks forward packets of data from one device to another until, like the final post office, the final device forwards the data to the destination computer. To understand networking, it helps to start thinking in layers. In fact, a model was developed many years ago to break up the complex process of sending data from one computer to another into seven steps or layers. Called the Open Systems Interconnection, or OSI, reference model, this model identifies the steps and functions that must be completed at each layer when computers communicate over a network. These seven layers are like a set of building blocks stacked on top of each other. In fact, the seven layers combined are often referred to as a network stack. The OSI model, however, provides only guidelines on how computers communicate over a network. It does not provide detailed procedures on how to actually make this communication happen. These procedures for communication are called protocols and define how actual communication occurs. A protocol is a formal set of written rules or procedures that computers must understand, accept, and use to be able to talk to each other over a network. Different protocols are used at different layers of the reference model. Just as two people need to speak the same language to communicate, two computers must use the same protocol at the same layer for the data to be communicated. More than merely a common language, protocols are like the rules of etiquette frequently encountered among spoken languages. When you start a conversation, you usually say hello and wait for the other person to greet you. You typically take turns talking and asking questions. Network protocols operate in the same manner, defining rules such as when computers are able to transmit data, which computer the data is destined for, and what to do if the data is not received. The OSI reference model also describes how data should be passed from one layer to the next. On the sending computer, data flows down the model or stack. At each layer in the stack, protocols add headers and trailers or footers, which contain information such as addressing and error control information. When a lower layer receives information from an upper layer, it considers the entire package's data and adds its own header and, if needed, footer or trailer to the data. The process of adding headers and footers to data layer by layer is called encapsulation. On the receiving computer, data flows up the stack. At each layer, the addressing or protocol information is examined and removed layer by layer until the computer gets to the actual data. The process of removing headers at each layer of the stack is called de-encapsulation. The OSI reference model is theoretical in nature and, as we mentioned earlier, does not define actual protocols. The Department of Defense and the Internet Engineering Task Force developed a simpler four-layer model called the TCP-IP reference model. This model defines specific protocols at each of the four layers, such as TCP and IP, two of the Internet's core protocols. A group of network protocols that work together is called a protocol suite or a protocol stack. So the protocol suite that governs Internet communication is commonly called the TCP IP protocol suite and is based on the TCP IP reference model. The name is a bit misleading because TCP and IP are only two of dozens of protocols that make up the suite. Let's take a moment to compare the two reference models. On screen, you'll see both side by side. The first difference you'll notice is that the first three layers of the OSI reference model fold into a single layer in the TCP IP reference model, simply called the application layer. The transport and network layers map directly between the two models. 
the TCP IP reference model merges the lower two layers into the network access layer, which focuses on how data is transmitted over any type of physical network, regardless of whether it's a LAN or a WAN. The TCP IP model is not concerned with the details of this layer and uses existing standards, such as Ethernet or ATM. We cover these technologies later in the course. In practice, however, many people discuss TCP IP based networks using a five layer model that is a combination of the four layer TCP IP model and the seven layer OSI model. This commonly used networking model uses the first four layers of the OSI reference model. You'll notice that where the TCP IP model combined the original OSI data link layer and the physical layer into a single layer called the network access layer, this model breaks them back out. At the same time, like the TCP IP model, this model collapses the OSI model's application, presentation, and session layers into one layer, referred to as the application layer. Although there are only five layers in this model, the layers are commonly referred to using the original OSI numbering scheme. Layers 1 through 4 are the lower layers, and layer 7 is the application layer. This course uses this commonly used hybrid networking model. We cover each of its layers in more detail in a moment. Now let's take a closer look at how data is sent from one computer to another. We'll use the five-layer network reference model as a guide, and we'll also employ the post office model we discussed earlier to illustrate some concepts. As you saw already, at each layer of the network reference model, specific information is added about what type of data you are sending and where it's going. Ultimately, your data is converted to electrical signals, transported over the network, and then processed by the receiving computer. Now let's examine what specifically happens in each layer, including which protocols are used. When you send an email, the email program on your computer, such as Microsoft Outlook, interacts with the application layer. Behind the scenes, the email program sends the message or data to your Internet email server for delivery. The email application uses the SMTP, or Simple Mail Transport Protocol Application Layer Protocol, for this communication. Application layer protocols usually specify how data should be encoded, compressed, or encrypted, and how sessions should be managed. Some application layer protocols are shown on screen. Click any of the links on screen to learn more about each protocol, or click the Continue button to continue with this topic. Using our postal mail analogy, our data at this point is like a letter, written in a language the recipient understands and following common conventions for letter writing. However, our data does not yet have an envelope specifying where it should be sent. The application layer sends the data down the stack to the transport layer. The transport layer specifies which application layer protocol should be used to process the data once it arrives on the receiving computer. Each application layer protocol is assigned a unique numerical identifier called a port. Note that this port is a software port, not a hardware port. For example, HTTP uses port 80, DNS uses port 53, and SMTP uses port 25. This destination port number is analogous to the recipient's name on our envelope. Just like there might be multiple people living at a single address, each with a unique name, multiple programs might be running on the destination computer using different application layer protocols. Each application layer protocol has a unique port number, so incoming data can ultimately find the correct program. The transport layer includes the destination port number in the header it adds to the data. When the data arrives at the destination computer, the transport layer there examines this number to determine the application layer protocol the data should be sent to. The transport layer on the sending computer also includes a source port number in the header, which is similar to the name in the return address. The source port number, typically a random number, uniquely identifies the connection on the sending side. This port allows the receiving computer to carry on multiple sessions with the sending computer without intermixing the data. Beyond identifying the destination and source port numbers, the transport layer has a second important responsibility as well. Again, let's consider our letter. When you are ready to mail your letter, you have a choice to make. 
You can simply add a stamp, drop it in the mailbox, and assume it gets there. Or you can request a return receipt, which the post office returns to you upon delivery, so you can be assured it has arrived. As its second responsibility, the transport layer offers a similar choice for reliability. The User Datagram Protocol, or UDP, and the Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP, are two transport layer protocols in the TCP IP protocol suite. UDP and TCP are also known as Layer 4 protocols because they take place in the fourth layer, the transport layer. UDP is a very simple and fast protocol. UDP is a best effort delivery service providing no delivery notification, error checking, or recovery procedures. It's exactly like dropping your envelope in a mailbox and hoping for the best. With UDP, the sending computer doesn't know if the receiving computer actually received the data. Applications sending short messages or time-sensitive data such as DNS online gaming, voice over IP or VOIP, and streaming video applications like IPTV often use UDP because speed is critical. Voice and video applications are designed to handle occasional packet loss without a major impact on performance. For example, you might see a video jump or you might miss a word in a phone call. Sometimes you might not even notice a problem. When you type a URL in your web browser, behind the scenes you are using DNS to find the IP address of the web server. DNS must operate quickly and most of the time you receive a quick DNS response. But if for some reason you don't receive a DNS response, no harm done. You can simply try to access the web server again later. TCP, on the other hand, is a more robust protocol, providing delivery notification, error checking, and recovery procedures. With TCP, the receiving computer tells the sending computer when the data was received. It's equivalent to sending our letter by registered mail with a return receipt. HTTP, SMTP, and FTP all use TCP. TCP accepts data from the application layer protocol and cuts the data into smaller pieces called segments to ensure a steady flow of data between two computers regardless of the differences in connection bandwidth. Segmentation is like taking our letter and sending each page in a separate envelope. By numbering the pages, the recipient can place the pages back in order. Likewise, TCP assigns a sequence number to each segment. On the receiving side, TCP uses the sequence numbers to put the segments back together in the correct order. The receiving side uses the sequence numbers to tell the sending side when segments have been received, just like the return receipt in our postal analogy. If the sending side does not receive an acknowledgement within a reasonable amount of time, it resends the segments. Once this process is complete, the transport layer sends the data or segments down to the network layer, which is also known as layer 3. The network layer takes a segment and adds a header to create a packet. The layer 3 header contains a destination and source internet protocol or IP address. You'll also hear these addresses referred to as layer 3 addresses or logical addresses. Layer 3 addressing can be compared to adding your recipient's address and your return address on an envelope. We cover IP addressing in much greater detail later in the course. Notice that the network layer treats the data it receives from the transport layer as one piece of data. It does not need to inspect the transport layer headers or the original data during the encapsulation process. As part of its own headers, the network layer adds a number identifying the upper layer transport layer protocol. Each transport layer protocol is assigned a unique identifier or IP protocol number. For example, UDP is IP protocol number 17 and TCP is IP protocol number 6. When you send an email, the sending computer uses TCP as its transport layer protocol. When the sending computer adds the layer 3 header to the data, it identifies the IP protocol number as 6. When the receiving computer unwraps the data layer by layer, the network layer examines this IP protocol number to determine which upper layer protocol should process the data next. Because in this example, the IP protocol number is set to 6, the network layer on the receiving computer sends the data to the TCP protocol for further processing. The next layer down the stack is layer 2, which in our five-layer model is called the data link layer. Layer 2 receives the packet from the network layer and, like the layers above it, adds its own header to the packet to create a frame. The header usually includes another address, commonly referred to as a layer 2 address, 
a physical address, or a media access control or MAC address. This address is different from the IP address or Layer 3 address added by the network layer. It can be compared to the addressing on the post office's sorting containers we saw in an earlier section. We explain this analogy in more detail in the next section. The Layer 2 header typically also includes an indication as to which Layer 3 protocol is in the data portion of the frame. Layer 2 also performs its own data integrity check so that corrupted or damaged frames are discarded as early as possible in the transmission process. This check is done by adding a checksum in the trailer at the end of a frame. A checksum is the result of a mathematical calculation. The sending computer runs the computation and inserts the checksum into the frame's trailer. The network device receiving the frame runs the same calculation. If the computation results match, the frame is accepted. If they do not, the frame is discarded. Finally, Layer 2 converts the data into a format that the physical layer can understand, the ones and zeros of digital communications. The physical layer, or Layer 1, converts these bits into electrical signals and sends them across the physical medium, which can be a telephone wire, a fiber optic cable, or even a wireless environment. Physical layer specifications define characteristics, such as cabling specifications, voltage levels, physical data rates, maximum transmission distances, and physical connectors. In our mail analogy, the physical layer is like the mail truck, airplane, or train that carries the letters from post office to post office. Once the data arrives at the destination computer, it travels up the stack with each layer examining and removing the headers and trailers added by the corresponding layer on the source computer. The physical layer sends the bits up to the data link layer where they are reassembled into a frame. The data link layer verifies the checksum and removes the layer 2 frame. It then sends the packet up to the network layer. The network layer examines the layer 3 destination address and verifies that the packet arrived at the correct destination. Next, it examines the protocol number to determine the transport layer protocol. It strips off the layer 3 header and sends the data up to the appropriate transport layer protocol. If the transport layer is using TCP, it collects all the segments, reassembles the data, and sends an acknowledgement to the sending computer indicating that the data was received. If the sending computer does not receive the acknowledgement, it resends the segments. Next, the transport layer examines the port number and sends the data to the correct application layer protocol. The application layer protocol handles the data in whatever manner is specified by that specific protocol so that it can be used as intended on the receiving computer. In this section, we took an in-depth look at what happens at each layer of the reference model we refer to in most of this course. To learn more about the protocols used at each layer of this model, click the first link on screen. If you're interested in seeing how this same general networking functionality is associated with the seven-layer OSI reference model, click the second link on screen. You have reached the end of this section. Click Next when you're ready to continue. To understand how networks work, it's critical to understand the two different types of addressing networks use. As we just mentioned, Layer 3, or the network layer, adds an address to the data as it flows down the stack. Then, Layer 2, or the data link layer, adds another address to the data. So why bother with two different addresses? Good question. To understand the role of the two different addresses, let's return to our post office analogy. On screen you see our letter but you also see the sorting containers the post offices use to route mail. Notice that both the letter and the sorting containers have addresses, and the addresses are different. The address on the letter is the final destination of the letter, while the addresses on the containers are the addresses of the next post office en route to the final destination. Both sets of addresses are necessary for delivering the letter and can be compared to Layer 3 and Layer 2 addresses in networking. To better illustrate this concept, Let's take a closer look at mail sorting in action. On screen, you see the post office where our letter was sent after we dropped it in the mailbox. We'll call this post office A. By looking at the first four digits of the postal code, the post office determines that our letter should be placed in the container destined for post office C. Once at post office C, the process is repeated. At each post office along the route, more and more information from the address of the letter is needed. 
Here, the full postal code is needed, and the letter is placed in the container going to Post Office Z. Now the letter has been transported to Post Office Z, the destination post office for postal code 82070. The letter is now sorted on even more specific information, the street address for the mail carrier to deliver. And finally, whoever picks up the mail at the destination address sorts the letter by the most specific information possible, the recipient's name. Delivering the letter to the final mailing address is equivalent to delivering data to the correct Layer 3 address. But the addresses on the post office containers are just as necessary for delivering that letter. The addresses of those containers are equivalent to Layer 2 addresses. By the way, Layer 2 addresses are sometimes referred to as MAC addresses, hardware addresses, or physical addresses. Layer 3 addresses are also known as IP addresses or logical addresses. Later in this course, we'll take a look at the meaning behind the digits and MAC addresses and IP addresses. Like a mailing address for a letter, a Layer 3 address identifies a unique destination. Just as there's only one mailing address at your house, on a network, a network administrator assigns each computer a unique Layer 3 address. The destination and source Layer 3 addresses identifying the communicating computers or endpoints, just like an envelope has a destination address and a return address. Because the data source and ultimate destination always remain the same, Layer 3 addresses never change. Conversely, the destination and source Layer 2 addresses identify the stops made along the way and not the communicating computers or endpoints. Layer 2 addresses change with each stop along the route to the final destination. Don't worry if you still have questions about these two types of addressing. We revisit both types in more detail later in the course. Here's a chance for you to review some of the basics about what takes place at each layer of the five-layer networking model. To complete the puzzle on screen, drag each puzzle piece to fit in an empty spot on the related networking layer. You're presented with one puzzle piece at a time in random order. Some puzzle pieces are labeled with networking concepts, and some are labeled with the corresponding parts of the post office analogy. Incorrect matches will bounce back. Match all items correctly on the first try to receive a perfect score. If you'd like a hint, click any question mark in the graphic column. 